Sure enough. <laughs> hey, <laughs> so I am now on the line with a Mr. Miguel Montero. Did I say it right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You kind of sounded like Spanish, but yeah, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Mr. Montero, you are an international Kizamba as well as Simba instructor, dancer, and performer. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you started dancing Kizomba back in 1997, which is a very long time, a lot of experience. And you started teaching back in 2009. Is that right, sir? Is that, that's 100% right. It means that I'm old. Yes. <laughs> I, I, can I swear here? No, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, you definitely can. This is your interview. You can do what you want. Okay, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting old. I'm getting old. I'm getting old. Hey, um, and I told you this before we started, Mr. Montero, but, you know, I want to say it again. I greatly appreciate you taking time out your day to talk to me, sir. I really do. Man, it's my pleasure. My hey. pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Hey. Um, so real quick question, Mr. Mr. Montero. Were you born and raised in Portugal? Is that right? Yes, 100%. Hey. Born and raised in Portugal, Lisbon, Portugal, in the, in the city of Lisbon. And yeah, right now I don't live exactly in Lisbon, but... I lived my the first 14 years of my life. I lived exactly in the center of Lisbon. Okay, so unfortunately, I have never had the chance of visiting Lisbon. So I would absolutely love to hear from you. Know what was your childhood like growing up in Portugal, growing up in Lisbon? What was that like for you? Man, it was I, I can it, it was different like the from today. You know, you know, Portugal today it's a different country than it was when well, I'm 42 years old. Okay, so I was born in 1979. So at the time, Portugal was different. So I, I lived in a neighborhood that doesn't exist anymore. So it was uh, one of those poor neighborhoods in the middle of Lisbon. Uh, then they got demolished, I don't know when, but it was around when I was like 15, 16 years old. And my childhood was great, man. I, I, had, to, I had the chance to experience things on hand. Uh, I think I had a normal childhood. Not not like with a, with a lot of money or anything, but I think, yeah, like most of people my age that time, I think I had an amazing uh, childhood. I understand, I understand. Let me, let me ask you this. Uh, I'm very curious to hear from you. How important was music growing up in your childhood? Man, it's always important. Yeah, it was very important. Actually, when I was in my childhood, there is, there is a funny story. Yeah, because I, um, I, I lived in a, in a neighborhood like I told that doesn't exist anymore. And it was a very mixed neighborhood. OK, there was a lot of um, uh, some Portuguese people, a lot of African people, a lot of Indian people. So it was it was a very big mix. So the cultural the, the cultural influences uh, in terms of music was very mixed. And at the time, I didn't like Izomba at all. Uh, because I was like every single time, every single day I was listening to it and I didn't, I didn't enjoy it because it was like every single time listening to the same thing. So it was a, it's a very funny story. But then it becomes, it became very, the time that I remember that became really, really important was the time when I was becoming 15, 16 years old. And at that time, uh, mainly, um, not, not, um, not Kizomba, but mainly Afro music became really really very very big part in my in my life but it was around that age that i started to really feel it um you know i guess i want to ask you this i'm very curious man you know it's maybe a a, a repeat question man but <laughs> you know I, i'm very curious to hear about you know what was it like growing up in that melting pot growing up with you know africans and golans as well as growing up with your own culture you know in portugal man um you know, I guess, you know, what was your daily life like? What was it like going to school? What was it like yeah. just growing up in that melting pot? Well, it was actually, it's, it's very funny that you're asking that question because I still feel this today. And I'm going to tell, I know that not everybody feels like this, but this is how I felt. Um, I felt, I felt the same. I didn't, I didn't even understand at the time. I was not even thinking that there was my Portuguese culture. There was the African culture. There is the Indian culture. There was the culture that I was in. I didn't. I wasn't distinguish the, the distinguishing the culture. You know what I mean? So for me, it was very natural. Of course, we are we were, were all poor, so we were all in the same boat. Uh, we went to the same schools, and um, uh, of course, I was not treated like. For example, I lived in in that, that neighborhood was in a part of Lisbon, 
that like I told you, it doesn't exist anymore, that neighborhood, but it was very close to very rich parts of, of Lisbon. You know, there was, you know, where there are those small ghettos and then you have like um, big houses and everything. So it was kind of like that. So the school that we were in was, was a school like um, where people um, treated, treated us, the poor ones, a little bit worse, you know, but I was, but I, it was the same as all my friends in my neighborhood, you know. So I did, there was no difference between culture in that term. It, it was a difference of so, social status. So we were the poor ones, so <laughs> we were put a little bit to the side, but I think that's, that was great because that shaped us as people and as men, and I, I feel very grateful for the childhood that I had. Okay, okay, I understand that, I definitely do. So, um, so yeah, so you're growing up in Portugal and everything. You said, you know, things start to change for you when you get, you said around 15 or 16, as far as your, yeah. I guess, music interests, you know, what, what changes for you around that age? It was not, it was not the, the music, actually. The music was just one of the parts that came into my life. But what changed was my way of, of seeing things. So when I was a very introverted people, person, you know, I was very shy. I know that people that know me today cannot even imagine that. But yeah, it's true. But I was very, very shy. And when I was 15, 16, I decided to do something um, that was related to dance. Uh, because I didn't dance, I didn't have anything related to dance at the time. Okay, and what I'm saying related to dance was like really trying to get into something related to dance. So I went, I went to do some capoeira because I liked the, the fighting part and I liked the dancing part. So I decided to do capoeira. And as you, I, I think you might know, capoeira music goes with drums, bow, It's all that African flavor that um, that, that comes from from the instrument. So. At that part, at that part, when my when I started to do capoeira, I started to re, to gain really, really very strong confidence on myself, and I started to dance. I started to play instruments. I started to do all those things. So it was a kind of change in my life. I think it was the major the, the major change I had in my life was when I was 15, 16, because I changed from a very introverted person to a very confident person that I am today. So it was the biggest change, and the music was it was. Uh, the, the influence of the music was not only the music, you know what I mean? Was all the things around the music, was the music, was the dance, was the fight. Everything got together and created that, um, gave, gave me that confidence that I needed because I didn't have it at the time. Like I told you, when we come for a, a poor neighborhood, everybody looks at us like in a different way. So I had to make it for myself. Okay, now I understand that, man. Um... You know, I guess, let me ask you this. I'm, I'm very curious to hear from you, man. Um, you know, seeing as how you said you were 44 now, is that right, 42, 44? 42. Right. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Come on, I liked you before, brother. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, man. Uh, let me ask you this, though, man. Um, I'm very curious to hear from you. You know, what, could you put into words, I guess, the, the effects that learning Capoeira, you know, how did it impact your life? Learning it Man, at such an early age. It's, it's impossible to tell you in words because like I told you, it was like the, I'm, so I'm 42. It was the biggest change in my life. You know, so the, the thing that I can tell you that for you to try to understand, it was the biggest change in my life during my 42 years of living here in this planet Earth. You know, so it changed everything. It changed from being like, uh, someone that didn't matter and i was talking about myself not about the others to someone that was really confident about what he is what he can do what he can speak it was totally like like yeah, i don't know from morning to night was changing everything so yeah it really changed it really changed okay and i know you said you have your kids with you do you plan on getting your kids in capital wet is that what you uh is that the goal or not even uh, sorry sorry i didn't understand now I said, do, I, do you do you plan on also enrolling your kids in Capoeira as well, or not really? Man, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have any kids as oh. far as I know. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. I don't have any kids, but I think I think not only Capoeira was the the thing for me, yeah. But it, it doesn't have to be Capoeira. It can be something that will give you the the confident boost that you might need because you know. 15, 16 years old is tough, brother. It's it's really tough. And sometimes, and right now, I think it's even worse because 
the, the world the way it's developing, I think this age is even worse. So I think anything that you can do that will get you the confident boost that you need to, to trust yourself, to be a decent person, because right now I think it's, I think it's a major issue sometimes, I don't know. But yeah, I think a Capoeira worked for me. Uh, it worked for my, my friends at school that were with me over there, but some, some other people went to do some other things, some other sports. I think that sports is, is the thing. Sports is one of the things that really drives you forward. Okay, no, I definitely understand that. I definitely do, man. Um, so, so, you know, you, you start doing Capoeira and I'm curious, um, you know, does that lead you into, you already say you know, you become a more gregarious, a more outgoing person. Is that how you initially get started in dancing or, you know, what does Capoeira take you? No, no. The thing is Capoeira was, I, like I told you, the neighborhood was quite tough. So I want to learn how to fight and I loved the music and I loved the, the instrument. So Capoeira was the same for me. Yeah, I, I'm very, I'm a small person. Uh, in meters, I'm 164. So I'm not a very tall one. So it's like Capoeira met me because of the jing, of the movements. So everything worked out for me. And the thing about Capoeira was the, you know, that Capoeira, uh, historically, it comes from Brazil. Yeah. But uh, it comes from an African Brazil. You know, it's like from the, the slave, from, from Banto slave that came from some of them from Angola. So all that, all that, um, uh, that thing, all that uh, mixture, all that cultural parts, that what came, br brought me to the Kizomba scene, you know, because um, imagine, in Capoeira was like, um, most of the people that were in Capoeira was the kind of the same social status than me, yeah? But um, a lot of Africans, a lot of Capverdians, a lot of Angolan, so Kizomba was a very strong thing in the Capoeira group. Okay, Kizomba mostly, not only Kizomba, Kuduro was the most, most famous one because we were all kids and kids dance Kuduro. You know, they, they say, you used to say that Kizomba was for the older people. And when we were kids, Kuduro is the thing. So yeah, it was kind of like that. So it was my introduction to the proper Kizomba scene was at the time. Okay, that's awesome, man. Um... So I guess, let me ask you this, man. I don't know if you know too much about the history, man, but uh, I know, you know, Portuguese, they call it, what is it called, Palop? Palop, yeah. Yeah, Palop. Um, yeah, yeah. Talk to, I don't know if you know too much, but can you talk to me about, you know, I guess maybe the history or maybe, you know, why there are so many Angolans in Portugal? Do you know much about that? Well, I, I know, I, I think I know enough. I don't know everything, of course. And I know only my perspective, uh, for sure. My Angolan friends may have uh, other perspectives. You know that um, Angola was occupied by Portugal until 75. Yeah. So I, I'm not, I think I'm not making a mistake. 74, I think it was 75. And um, so at the time, Portugal and Angola, until that time, were a country. You know, we're part of the same of the same uh, republic, uh, Portuguese rep republic. So um, there was a lot of interchange. You know, actually, my mom my mom lived in Angola until seventy four uh, before before our government came down. So she lived there. So there was like a lot of Portuguese people living in Angola. And then Angola was very poor at the time. Of course, uh, they were. We, we we had a very very a very bad government until seventy four. And that was the government that was um, keeping Angola as a um, as a colony. So I'm I'm 100 sure that Angolan people didn't live didn't live very well. They didn't have a lot of funding, a lot of money. So coming to Portugal was a natural step because at the time Portugal Portugal Portuguese people didn't have a lot of money, but Portugal itself did have a lot of money. Yeah, because of the government that we have. So I think that's why we came a lot of a lot of people from Angola looking for, for more studies, came here from Cabo Verde, all from all the Palop countries. And um, a lot of them came here because of that. So it was like uh, the natural way to go. If you want to do something, a uh, better school, or you do you want to drive a better life, you come to Portugal. At the time, it was kind of like this. Now it's kind of changing. You know, If you want to make more money, you go to Angola or you, you do something else. So, but at the time, it was kind of like that. So that's my perspective of it. Okay, let me ask you this. Um, you know, you've been living in Portugal your whole life, I assume. Mm -hmm. I'm very curious to hear, man, how has, 
how has Portugal changed from when you were, you know, a child to, you know, what you see today? Man, it's completely different, man. It's completely different in terms of uh, social behavior. As, well, I live in Lisbon. We have to distinguish two different things, okay? One thing is Lisbon. The other thing is the rest of Portugal. You know, because Lisbon is multicultural. Lisbon is a, a city that has everything. But if you go to the interior of Portugal, it's not like that, you know? So Lisbon is it's a different spot. And it changed a lot in terms of economics. It changed, it changed a lot. So I think right now, and my, some people might disagree, but I think right now the, the opportunities to succeed economically here in Lisbon are, are much better. So I don't, I'm not saying it's amazing, but I, I can't complain. So I think it's much better. If you want to work, I think it's a place where you can, you can manage. Uh, in terms of, um, of social, social, how uh, can I say this? Uh, people connecting with each other is different. It, it, it's different from other places as, as well here in Portugal. I think it's easier because it's a multicultural city. Like I told you, if you go to the center of Lisbon, it's very simple, very easy for you to find African, Indian, uh, Western Europe people. It's very, a lot of people together very different to different origins so it's 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 easier to connect at the time at the time when i was young um it was different okay it was different it was not everybody was not treated um the way it's treated right now and i think it's an evolution i think portugal went to a, not a natural evolution of of understanding of knowing people and treating people um, in a way that should be treated and i think it's a great place to live man i'm not i'm being honest i traveled Man, not all over the world, but I travel to more than 50 countries already, and I wouldn't change Portugal or Lisbon for any of them. So <laughs> I I think I know what I'm talking about. That's awesome, man. I would <clears throat> I would absolutely love to visit one day, man. I would absolutely love to visit one day, man. Man, you'll fall in love. Man. Women here are beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's beautiful women everywhere, but I understand what you mean. <laughs> um, so so you say, you know, you got into a little bit of Kidoro. Uh, and you said you said that was for the kids. Um, I guess you know. Tell me, man. You know how, why, when did you start to transition into Simba and Kizomba? How did that come about? I, no, I didn't. I didn't. I actually, was a, it's, it's interesting because uh, there, it was present in the in the in the Capoeira group. Okay, it was present. So when we went, we we had some parties at the time. There was no Kizomba parties like there are today. Okay, there were there were some specific places in Lisbon where you could go to some African parties, not Kizomba parties, that is different. When we're talking about an African party, we are talking about a party when it has food, drink, uh, hip hop, Brazilian music, um, techno, and Kizomba, some, some Kizomba, some Simba. Okay, that's an African party. When you go to a Kizomba, talking about Lisbon reality, Portugal reality, okay? When you go to a Kizomba party, it's a Kizomba party. You have some Kizomba, some Simba, and that's it. So it's different. At the time, there was nothing like that. It was like there was African parties. But there was the Kizomba parties. We had it when we did some our private parties. So imagine someone, it was someone's birthday. And we went to someone's house and some Kizomba would be playing. So that was the, the Kizomba scene at, at, at the time you know so my transition didn't didn't happen there because there was no transition it was for me it was a plain ride there was not a change the change only came when i went to a dance school in 2007 and i wanted to learn salsa so that was the transition and when i wanted to learn salsa they figured out that i could dance kizomba yeah at the time, they understood that I could dance Kizomba. So there was uh, the, the teacher, uh, I don't remember well, but the teacher that was teaching at that school uh, could not teach anymore over there, I don't remember. And they asked me if I could teach. And I said I couldn't because I, I didn't have any skill of teaching. I, I had teach Capoeira before, but I, had, I didn't teach Kizomba before. So I had no structure, I had nothing. I could do only the steps that we did in our parties and the, it was nothing, as you can imagine kids dancing and it was it was different um i cannot tell you this because i know you're recording but it was different and uh, so so the transition really transition happened in 2007 when i went to start to teach to to learn salsa and then they realized i knew how to dance kizomba and then in the time they were starting to mix kizomba with salsa in the parties in the salsa parties and so that was 
when he started transition. That's when people started to see me dancing Kizomba. And that's when I met Susana because Susana was a student of salsa at the school. So, so that's what, that's where everything that happened that happens right now, uh, Kizomba related in my life happened there. Ooh, okay. I got a couple questions for you, man, but let me ask you this. I'm very curious to hear from you, man. Um, how is the Kizomba that you grew up dancing, how was that different than what we dance today? Meaning what you see on Instagram, oh. what you see on Facebook, you know, what is... No, man, it's a totally different, not a totally different dance, but it's... So I can tell you, when I started dancing Kizomba, there was one step that I could do, okay? Just one. It was Tarashinya. Yeah, that's Tarashinya. That's the only thing we were interested when we were kids. <laughs> that's you know two different I mean? dances, though, right? Man, yeah, well, yeah. Right, then after that, but that's a complicated story. So, yeah, so I could do, I could do the basic steps and I could do Tarashinya. Okay, but I, I did I did understand how it works, but I didn't know how to do a saida. I didn't know how to do anything like that. And the dance, uh, the dance itself at the time, that it had some saidas, but the basic kizomba dance when I was at least what I remember um, was basic three, basic three, basic three, basic three. Not of that fancy things we have right now. So kizomba as a dance also has an evolution until today. Um, let me ask you this. For people who may be, who may be beginners or maybe just unaware, um, can you put into words the difference between kizomba and simba? Man, I, I'm saying this to my students all the time when they go because I have a beginners simba class, and the first question that I that I ask them when they go there is. What, what, do you, what do you guys think that are the differences between Kizomba and Sam? And they start to, to say a lot of things, okay? They start to say, uh, it's the speed, it's the steps, it's the tricks. And I just say one thing, I don't want, to, I don't want you to be sad, but the only difference between Sam and Kizomba is the music. And they start looking at me and they don't understand very well. And then I, I, put, I, play, I play some music and I explain them. I'll show them the kizomba music, uh, the samba music, and how you dance the same step according to the music. So the difference is just one, it's the music. And then you have the steps that you have adapted to the style of music that you're listening to. That's it. Okay. I was, uh, I'm, a, I'm a super star. I was actually gonna say, in my opinion, I thought it was the music. So I'm glad you said that I, <laughs> I feel so. <smart. laughs> no, it's the music because, Understanding, understanding Kizomba is actually quite simple. Kizomba itself um, it, it doesn't have a dance, okay? It, it wasn't created with the dance. It was, there was a dance in the 50s called Pasada. Then that dance was adapted to the Samba music. And then the same dance was adapted to Kizomba music. So the Pasada was the dance adapted to the styles of music that were at the time. Okay. So it's the same dance, of course, adapted, but the same dance. Uh, let, let me ask you this, and I might be an obvious answer, but you know, how, how popular was Kassav in, in Lisbon? Uh, sorry, sorry, I can understand. Uh, I said, how popular was the music band Kassav? How popular were they in Lisbon? On my part, as in my part, not very popular because I was because you know, I'm Portuguese, so I don't speak French and it, it, it was not very thing, a very big thing for me, but in Lisbon for the African from, from the Palop, uh, communities was very very important, very strong, you know. Because uh, Palops, uh, if you're going to talk about it to some Mongolian people or Cape Verdean, sorry, Cape Verdean people, they love Kasab. You know, Kasab was a, a very strong influence for them. And uh, yeah, but for me as a person, not a lot, not a lot. I have to be honest. I like it, I dance it, but when I was a kid, I don't even knew what Kasab was. Okay, I understand. Um, I, yeah. I want to go back. I want to go back to uh, when you joined that dance school. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you said you wanted to learn how to dance salsa. Uh, yeah. I guess maybe maybe a two part question for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. First part being, you know, what inspired you to learn salsa, and the second part being, tell me 
about your beginner stage in sauce. I want to hear about that. <laughs> very funny, brother. Very, very funny. So um, why did I, I, I went to go learn salsa? Because I wanted to learn social dancing. Um, so I wanted to meet new people. It was a, a stage in my life where I, I wanted to, to get to know uh, more people. So I went to dance salsa with two um, motives. First one, meet people. Okay, second one, learn how to dance salsa. So it was, was not only dancing salsa, it was to meet people. That I, and, I, and I think a lot of people do this uh, today, even today. It's a social dance, so we want to socialize. Okay, now my, my beginner stage in dancing salsa were terrible because um, I, come, I come from Afro-Brazilian dances, okay? Because when we are in capoeira, at least in the group that I was, we didn't dance only, we didn't do only capoeira, okay? We danced a lot of different Brazilian dances from the Northeast of Brazil. So we did some caboclinhos, we did frevo, we did coco, a lot of dances that are from, from traditional Brazilian dances from the interior. Um, so I had all the ginga of those dances because I started doing it when I was really, really, really young. So when I went to salsa, I had more jinga than the ladies. You know what I mean? So I was doing the steps and I was like, ta 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 and a lot of people were looking at me saying, this guy's funny. The, and it took me a little bit of time to adapt and control the movement that I had to adapt my movement to the salsa. So my beginner stages in terms of understanding steps, it was really fast. Uh, because I had all that knowledge about uh, mechanical, about my body. I knew how my body works. I knew how to do capoeira movement. So if you understand how do you do how you do a capoeira movement, how the body works to be able to do the movement, the dance is just another technique. So we, I was fast learning the technique, but it was very hard for me to to adapt the jinga, the movement to the salsa movement. Um, for people who may be unaware. How would you define the word Jenga? Oh, Jenga is called Jenga's movement. The origin of the word Jenga is N Jenga. Okay, it's a Kimbundu word. Uh, it comes from, it comes from um, one of the dialects of Angola, Jenga. And Jenga, it's a tradition translation directly to Portugal, movement, movement. Okay. Okay, Roger that, Roger that. So, um, so you know, you said you, you had your, you know, your troubles initially learning sauce and everything, man. You said as well, you also met your partner at that dance school as well, right? She helped me. She okay. helped me on the salsa. She was like, she was a student there and she was, she was, I'm going to tell you this. It was, it's a very funny story. People sometimes when I say this, because it has been a long time ago. So people look, I look at me like with different eyes because she was only, uh, I don't think, I don't know if she was already 13 years old. Or, or if she, she was 12 to 13. I don't rem remember if she was already 12 or 13 years old when we met. So I was 27. So <laughs> it was like a baby helping me on the dancing scene. But that, that's, I think that's how we, it should be. It was really, really interesting. And she was a very good dancer because she danced already since she was 10. So she already knew a lot of things. So yeah, she, that's, that's what I met her. Okay, I understand, I understand. Um... So yeah, you meet your dance partner there. And then you, you know, you kind of spoke on this earlier where the dance school found out that you danced Kizamba. So they wanted you to end up teaching there. Is that right? Exactly. That's it. That's it. That's how it happened. <clears throat> and, okay, and at so the time it was not normal. At the time it was not normal. For example, at the time uh, it was weird, a, a white guy teaching Kizomba here in Portugal. So that's, that's something that we, most of us are not aware right now, and thank God, because things change and people adapt. But at the time, it was a very funny thing. It was weird to see a white guy teaching his own. Mm. Okay, so, you know, I, I really want to hear about that, man. So let me ask you this, you know, going back to that time period, you know, tell me about your beginner stage in learning how to teach. You know, what was that like for you? Man, learning how to teach uh, was not extremely hard, not learning how to teach, because I, I already had taught capoeira at the time. So I did, I did know how to teach, not, of course, like not, like, like not today, but I didn't know how to teach. The, the problem was, um, because we're talking about 2000, it was 2008, because I started teaching 2009. 
So uh, the problem was to have a methodology. That was the issue because the only methodologies that existed was at the time from Master Pechu and from Zé Barbosa. Okay, those were the ones that created uh, some teaching methodology. Um, so, but there was not a lot. There was not a lot of information. I mean, that, that's not like today. You don't go to YouTube and and you see things. Yeah. So it was very very hard to. It was me trying to adapt what I knew to the um, one of the choreographers of contemporary dance that we had at the school called Andrea. She was the one that had the biggest knowledge about methodology. So we tried to. Um, she tried to teach me how to create a methodology, and I started creating the methodology with Susanna uh, of how to teach Kizomba, how we felt it would be a good way to teach Kizomba to people that never had the opportunity to experience it. So it was a very, it was, it, it was hard, and at the same time it was challenging. So yeah, I think, I think, I think it was important for me to go through that process. Okay, that is, that is very difficult. Um... I'm trying to think how to word this question, man. I'm very curious to hear. Well, let me ask you this. Um, you know, seeing how times have changed and we and we have, you know, somewhat of a blueprint, somewhat of a pedagogy on how to properly teach Kizamba. Um, you know, what advice do you have for new instructors or people who are thinking about getting into teaching you know what advice what words of wisdom can you give these people man the first the first thing i'm going to tell them is that you're going to suck when you start you know because everybody wants to be uh, and thinks they are perfect and they are amazing and when but i'm going to tell you this and i think this is 100 true everybody that starts really sucks while they when they are teaching it was it was my story was the story of my friends all the colleagues that i know so don't be frustrated okay and try to learn as much as you can from everybody doesn't matter if it's like a more experienced person less experienced person just drink from everybody just pay attention what they say even if you agree, agree or disagree you pay attention because you're going to learn something with anyone it doesn't matter i, I even today i go to when i'm in festivals uh, and I'm not extremely tired, I go to some classes because uh, I want to learn. Maybe I'm not going to learn a lot about the steps that they do because it doesn't fit my character, but I'm going to learn something about how do they connect with a specific situation or with a specific student. So this is a, a search that you have to have every time that your teaching is on. And that one is one of the most important things as a teacher. So I think that would be the advice I would give them. Okay. Uh, I'm curious to hear from you, man. I'm um, going back to your beginner stage. Uh, you told me, you know, you told me it was a lot of basic threes when you would dance by yourself. I'm, I'm very curious to hear from you. You know, how, how did you level up? How did you improve your dancing? How did you, you know, come up with new things to teach? Were you going to your friends? Were you going to socials? You know, how did you improve yourself to have something new to teach every week? Yeah, yeah. So that's exactly what I did. I, so I, I, was, I, I looked up information. I, I went to the socials. I stayed sitting down in my corner, looking, understanding, observing. I tried to practice. I tried to create something with the knowledge that I had, the small knowledge that I had. And with Susanna, I had rehearsal with Susanna. Okay, let's do this. Let's see if this works. And let's practice that step that I saw somewhere. Or let's practice that thing. And we had some references. Of course, uh, Master Pechu was our main reference. So we, are, we already had the reference of Pechu. So it was combining all those references, with inputs, things that I saw, things that we saw, things that we think it could work, things that we tried. Um, so it was kind of like that. At the time, if, if you want to be, to, 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 to be a good Kizomba dancer and you are not part of a community, it's it going to be hard. Yeah, it's going to be hard. It was not, I think that was only at the time. I only remember of one YouTube video of Kizomba by Mr. Tomas Keita, I'm sure you know, Tomas Keita from Guinea, and he, he actually had the first YouTube video online, and um, it was the only one that, uh, that, that I remember seeing. Maybe there were more, but there was a time. So it was, YouTube was not a thing at the time. It was not a thing. You, you brought this up early, man. I, um, I want to, I really want to hear from you, man. Um, you know, Talk to me about, I don't know, maybe it was a hurdle. 
maybe it was not an obstacle for you, man, but, you know, was it, did you run into any issues with you and your partner, you know, being uh, two Caucasian people teaching Kizomba in, in Lisbon? Did you run any issues over that? Not, not issues, not issues. So I, I, that, that's a very interesting story. So uh, for us, for us, it was not an issue. It was a cultural thing. So of course, if um, at the time, Kizomba was mainly danced in African parties. Yeah. If you see a Caucasian person teaching Kizomba, you're not used to it. So you ask. That's the only thing that we had. So, oh, it's weird. I never saw a Caucasian uh, teacher teaching. Yeah, but it was just that. So there was no issue um, in teaching Kizomba because of the skin of my color. No, there was no issue. There were some issues later in time when we started to get famous, but that was different. Okay, but I don't think that has to be, that didn't have anything to do, to do with the skin color. That uh, it, should, it, it, it was, I think it was more a cultural thing. Uh, why are those guys from Portugal doing something that is not from them and they are showing it to the world? I think it was the, the people adapting to the situation. I didn't think it, it could be, I could have like another color, doesn't matter which color was it, was it or be from another African country that made no sense for Kizomba scene. And I think it would be the same. Mm. One more question. Um, this will be the last tough question perhaps for you, man. Uh, it's not tough, man. You're asking easy questions. Okay. Me, this is very I, all right, shoot, shoot. That's, That's one, perfect, man. perfect. Yeah. So let me ask you this, man. Um, you know, some people, this, I'll, I'll be honest with you, man. Some people may look at you and they'll say, you know, it's cultural appropriation. And mm -hmm. while, while somebody else can look at you and say it may be cultural appreciation, you know, mm -hmm. where instead of you taking, you're actually just appreciating it. Um, you know, talk to me, just talk to me about that. What's your opinion on that? My opinion is it's purely facts, purely facts. And so it's not an opinion, it's purely facts. So I, me and Susanna, we travel to more than 50 countries to teach Kizomba, okay? So we are 100% sure that Kizomba today, it's Kizomba and Semba, because actually Semba, we were, I think at the time, we were the most dynamic teachers of Semba, of introducing Semba to Europe. Uh, so I'm 100% sure that Kizomba and Semba are more, more well known around the world because of us. We are, not, we are not the only ones, but we were one of the ones that really helped to bring Kizomba to all over the world. So uh, if that's not appreciation, I don't know what it is. If, so I think, I think facts speak uh, for it. Damn. So like I told you, not a very difficult question. For me, it's very easy. <laughs> for me, it's very easy to talk about it. Okay, that's awesome, man. So, so I guess, you know, take me back to, you know, I, I guess when... I don't know if you remember, you know, at what point, at what time period do you start to, you know, become heavily focused, heavily involved in Kizomba? You know, what happens for you? What, what makes you make that transition? Man, it was, it was, uh, there were two points. Okay. There were, there was the national part and the international part. Okay. The national part was when I started teaching Kizomba with Susanna, the classes were getting full. Uh, people really enjoyed the way that we teach Kizomba, okay? Uh, it was not only related to technique, it was people went to, to the class to have fun, you know? And we could provide that. We provide fun, we provide knowledge, we provide technique. So um, the classes were, were very, we had a lot of people. So of course, when you see that uh, you are being successful in something that depends on you, and people really appreciate what you do, you become eager to do more and do better. Yeah, I think that was, that was the, the biggest part. The second part was uh, when we decided, well, it was me that decided to try to do something internationally because there was not a lot. It was very, very small scene at the time. I think at the time it was like maybe three, three festivals around the world, at least that I knew. And uh, I went to one of them, um, my own, just to, to show myself, just for people to know, to know me. And uh, people liked me very much. So they 
contracted me for the next year. So it was my first festival in Warsaw, 2012, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it was my first, uh, 2012, 2013, I'm not sure, but it was one of those. Um, Warsaw is a festival. And uh, the, then when I went to the festival, the class had more than a hundred people. So my first time, my first class in a festival, and it had more than 100 people. So I saw that uh, because at the time there was one thing that I didn't tell you tell you is that um, at the time me and Susanna we created YouTube videos. We were the first teachers to create YouTube videos to teach steps and kizomba steps um, on YouTube. Okay. Well, not the first ones. I'm sorry. We are the second ones. The first one was was um, Zebra Bosa that had like a, a, a basic step video, uh, teaching a basic step video. And then me and Susanna started to do regularly, I think it was twice a week or something, uh, Kizomba steps for people to, to see and to learn and to practice. So when we went to that festival, to that workshop, a lot of people already knew us from YouTube. So we had a full class. So when we go to a festival in a foreign country and you have a full class, you'll see, okay, this is really cool. I want more of this. It's like a drug. So that was the major points nationally and internationally. Uh, let, me, let me ask you this. Um, you know, going back to those early stages, man, you know, growing up in a, in a community, in a culture where, you know, a lot of people, you know, are dancing. Um, tell me, how, how did you deal with, you know, maybe imposter syndrome or, or maybe when you were comparing yourself to other people and you're not feeling adequate or, or did you ever feel that way? When I was a kid, no. Okay. I didn't even think about it. Well, what about when you were teaching, specifically at that point? Uh, yeah, when I was teaching, so sometimes, uh, mainly with some Angolan, uh, some Angolan uh, people that, uh, well, still, even today, Okay, even today, and that's that's the thing about. But it's I think it's normal. This thing is normal. We we sometimes get some feedback mainly on YouTube. Um, you're not dancing gizomb. You're not dancing samba at all. You're like imposters and anything. Uh, when I was younger, maybe I was looking at that and thinking, and I have one or two days thinking about it. May, are they right? Today I don't care. I'm 100% sure of the work that I do. I have the support of very important people in the Kizomba community, mainly Master Pechu. It's the most important one if you're talking about European Kizomba or influence of Kizomba in Europe is Master Pechu. And he approves what we do 100%. He loves what we do. And um, so I know, I know I'm right. If the master is saying I'm right, I'm right. So I don't care what anyone else is saying. And everybody is entitled to an opinion. So I think that's it. I, I learned how to absorb those kind of comments and most of them I don't really care unless they are offensive if they're offensive I really care and I I talk back to them but if they are not offensive it's just an opinion so so let me ask you a follow-up question um you know for someone who is you know they don't have your amount of experience they don't have your you know your um support system you know they're very they may be early on in, in their journey um but, you know, they're dealing with that self-doubt. They're dealing with that imposter syndrome. They're dealing with, you know, comparing themselves to others. You know, what advice can you give that individual? The same advice that I told you at the beginning, okay? Just look for the information. Continue working. Continue looking for doing, do, do some courses. Right now, it's very simple to become a good Kizomba teacher, you know? There are a lot of uh, teacher courses, a lot of trainings. There are a lot of references that if you go to the Kizomba scene, you know that those people are references in the scene. So learn with them. Okay, talk with them. If you do that, it's gonna be it's gonna be easier. It's gonna be easier right now because all the platform is done. You know, uh, so now it's it's easier for you to if you're good. The thing about right now and the major difference that I can see from right now to when I started this was when I started there was no one. So even if you sucked, you could manage. Right. Today, there is a lot of people. You have to be really good or a really good teacher or a really good dancer or a really good communicator, but you have to be really good in one of them. If you are not, it's going to be very hard for you to be, well, to be successful in the Kizom scene. Um, I, I imagine that's a good thing, though. You know, at the, if the, as the overall talent 
improves, that can be only a good thing for Kizumba, right? I agree. Yeah. You've uh you you've mentioned a name a couple of times, and you know, certain people may be unfamiliar with this name, but you know, um, you know, talk talk to me, you know, tell me who is Master Petru? You know, who is that? Who is that individual? Man, everybody that is in Kizomba should know Master Petru. So if they don't, that's the first per person they have to look. Okay. Okay, Master Pechu is the responsible of the creator of the first Kizomba uh, methodology. Okay, the first way of teaching Kizomba. He himself, when you if you talk with him, it's going to be very funny because when they because it was a it was the same thing like me uh, when that school asked them to teach Kizomba, and Pechu never taught Kizomba before. Pechu was an Angolan that does Kizomba in his family with his friends. There was so he was the first one that decided, okay, I'm going to create this to teach, and um, for me. It's the most important person in the Kizomba family, in the Kizomba world, uh, because he brought Kizomba. It, I'm not saying he's the only one, but I think the, the work that he did gave us a base step for everybody to grow in. So uh, Master Pechu is the one of those persons that, uh, so I do this for some time already. And uh, if I'm traveling with Pechu, that sometimes happens, goes to some festival and we are going together and he starts talking, he starts talking and I just think to myself, I don't know anything. I I don't know nothing about what I'm doing or what I'm saying because every time he's talking, I'm learning tons of things. So it's like um, a, a well of information, you know? So yeah, that's Master Pechu. He's a very important person to the community. So so I guess, um, you know, I'm very curious. Uh, how were you able to be Master Pesci? Were you, does he teach in Lisbon? Yeah, he does teach in Lisbon, yeah. Okay, so I'm curious, yeah. I'm telling you, talk, talk to me about that. Uh, how were you able to meet Master Pesci? How did that come about? Man, it, I don't remember the exact situation when I met Master Pesci because we met in the beginning sometimes, I don't remember which one was it, but I can tell you that the, the strongest connection that we had was in back in 2013, they, I organized the competition of Sembo, yeah? So that, there was a challenge from a club here in Portugal called Barrio Latino. And they told me, well, we should do something. And I said, okay, let's do a Sembo competition. Let's organize a Sembo competition. And um, at the time when I decided to organize this, I was no one. So I had to get someone that was someone to make the, for, for the competition to be, uh, to have some credits, right? So I contacted Master Pechu for him to be a jury in that competition. So uh, it was then when we started to have a bigger, um, bigger connection. And so I think that was the main, I don't remember if it was the first time that we connect, but it was one of the first. Okay, okay, okay. Um, let me ask you this, I, I don't know this. Um, so, you know, currently is, is dancing your full-time profession? Is this what you do for a living? Uh, before, well, I, I always did some th more things, okay? If you're gonna talk about our main income, our main uh, thing that we do to bring us money to the table, before COVID was, yeah, before COVID was the main one. I always had more things to do because I like to do a lot of things. So, and um, if, yeah, but before COVID was the main thing was because it, actually, if you want to be very successful, you don't have time to do anything else, yeah? You don't have time. People don't have no idea the amount of time that requires to be to do what we do, uh, because they think that we just go to a class and we teach, or we go to a fist festival and we teach, or we are just they were going there and dancing, and they have no idea all the work that is done on the background, marketing wise, uh, contacts, uh, work uh, workouts, okay, physical workout, training, uh, technique, it's a lot of things that takes a lot of your time, a lot of your time. So if you're not 100% committed and not doing this as a full-time job, it's gonna be very, unless you have anyone else to do it for you. And it was not our case. We do all our work, all our contacts, all our advertisement. So yeah, it takes, it at the time took a lot of time. Um, and so I guess what now you have, you, you, you have, a, you're, are you a nine to five? Are you a regular guy? No, now? no, 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 no. I've always been an entrepreneur. Okay. I always had my own businesses. So our main business is still Miguel and Susana. Okay. So we do the events, uh, we do all those things, but now I'm managing a dance school. 
um, so I'm working in that area and I'm also also um, how do I say a personal trainer so um, I do a lot of things in the area so but it's kind of but if you're going to talk about the main one main one is always dancing okay always dancing it doesn't have to be only Miguel and Susana it can be around the dance area with the dance school but it's always dancing it's the, the area that I know more, more the, area, the area that I'm um, more expert on so yeah I should work on it let, let me ask you this uh, for for an individual for you know a, a group a couple one person uh, you know they have aspirations they have goals of becoming a professional dancer you know they want to be in your shoes um, mm -hmm. you know what is required of that couple or that individual to you know achieve their dreams Man, I think the same thing that uh, it's required to any other any other thing that you should do. Okay, you have to never give up. You have to go for it. You have to work hard. And you, there is no such thing as motivation. Okay, this is my podcast, so I can say what I think. So fuck motivation. Yeah, the important thing is for you to go there and have discipline. If you go and have discipline, and you you go and you practice and you practice and it, 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 it will become better. You will become better. But it's, it's not like one of those things. And I see some, well, as, I can, as you can imagine, I've been here for some time. So I saw a lot of things happening. And I saw some, some, a lot of people, not some, a lot of people trying to do something and complaining. Oh, but we do this and we are not recognized. And people don't accept us. And come on. If you started when I started, you would kill yourself. So that's not, a, not, not the thing. And not the thing. Yes, people will not accept you in the beginning. People will not believe in you because you didn't show anything. First, you work. Okay, you work, you work hard, you really work. You don't give up. You start showing, showing things. People will see, people will believe you when you have things for you to, to, see, to, to show. So that's the only way to go. Don't think that it's going to be easy. Yeah, it's not easy. No, I definitely believe that. I definitely but it's doable. <laughs> it's doable. Let me, let me ask you this. Um, you know, you have, you know, a vast amount of knowledge of experience uh, in dancing. Let me ask you this. What are some lessons that you've learned in dancing, through dancing, that you're able to translate to your everyday life? This one that I told you. Um, so this is the basic one. If you, you, you cannot give up. If you want to do something of yourself. It doesn't matter what it is. That's why I said in the beginning, it doesn't have to be in dancing. It has, it, it's everything in your life. Um, don't give up. If you like anything, if you like something, go and do it. If you, if, if you work for it, it, it will happen. If you don't, it will not happen. And that's a very simple. So, you know, as my background, uh, you didn't ask me in the beginning, but I'm going to tell you, I'm an engineer. Okay, I studied engineering. And I was working for um, for a company, and I quit, and because I just wanted to dance. So, and you can imagine the amount of money an engineer makes, or the amount of money a, a beginner dancer makes, right? So I made that change change because it was what I wanted to do. But um, some people are not able to have the strength to do that, or they think they don't have the strength. Then, yeah. So that's the most important thing. If you do what you like. That's the most important thing. And if you do what you like and you want to be recognized, brother, you just have to go work, 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 work really hard. And if you do, it will happen. At least it happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is that called? You ever heard of the survivorship bias? I believe is what it's called. No, no I haven't. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, we'll move <laughs> on. So let me, let me ask you this, man. Uh, in your opinion, we'll get back to dancing. I would love to hear from you, you know, in your opinion, what makes for a good follow? You know, what traits does an amazing follow have in your opinion? The first one is the same thing as a good leader, the good leader, okay? Don't be selfish. Um, and that's one of the, the issues. And when we start, when we have not regular classes, because regular classes, it's very hard to be very comprehensive in terms of technique, okay? We, gotta, we talk about some things, but it takes time. But when you have like private classes or boot camps, that's what the first thing we tell you, okay? Don't be selfish. Uh, the leader and the follower work as a team. Uh, if one doesn't trust the other, nothing works. 
Okay, so understanding that the leader and the follower is a team. Now then, as a follower, the, um, the rules are not very different of being a leader. Okay, the only difference between a follower and the leader is the leader says the direction. That's the only difference. Okay, everything else is the same. So the follower has to look for the leader the same way the leader has to look for the follower. And the way they look for each other has to, ha has to have a strong connection. And um, when I'm talking about connection, it's not only mental connection, but physical connection. Not too strong in terms of pressure, not being um, uh, very strong connected with each other, but if, uh, they have to try to look for each other. And when they look, they have to feel each other. If they don't, it's very hard to understand. I'm talking right now. I'm talking about kizom. Okay, I'm not talking about fusions or anything like that. When the frame is harder, you know, kizomba frame is not hard. Kizomba frame is soft. It's like a hug. So if you don't look for that body connection, it's very hard for you to be a good follow or, like I told you, a good leader. Um, all right, man, you brought it up, so I gotta ask you. I I want to hear, I want to hear your raw, unfiltered opinion on on the fusions you know what's your take on urban kids what's your take on you know all the all the uh offshoots of kids on no no i have no worries about it i love everything about it you know i think that first of all we have to understand music and dance are art right and art is art art you cannot staple something like uh, art is a moving thing right it becomes from the energy of each person so I do agree with all those evolutions. The only thing I didn't agree at the time was saying that Kizomba was what they now use as urban kids or fusion. Okay, that's the only thing that I didn't agree. And my complaint at the time right now, it's everything is settled. Uh, my complaint was that the people doing crazy stuff and saying this is, this is Kizomba. Kizomba it has, has some basic rules. Okay, and the basic rule of Kizomba is connection. If you lose the connection, you're doing something else, right? And was, but if you ask me, Miguel, do you like Urban Kiss or Fusion? Uh, I don't dance it because I'm not a very good at it because I don't feel it, yeah? But for example, if I'm going to watch a Kizomba show, uh, I think it's boring. But if I'm going to I'm going to watch a, Q, a Fusion show or a few, uh, Urban Kiss uh, show, I think, it's, I think it's nice because it has a lot of things that um, a, lot, a lot of elements that Kizomba, I'm talking about the social dance of Kizomba itself, doesn't have. So for in my opinion, you, don't, you cannot even make a Kizomba show. For, for you to be able to make a Kizomba show, you have to introduce fusion from other things for the dance to become interesting for a show, okay? We cannot confuse, confuse like, where is a show? What is a show, social dance? So yeah, going back to your question, if I might take on urban kids and fusion, I think it's an evolution of, of dance and music. I think it's great. Nothing against it. Um, I wanna I wanna definitely agree with you, man. I I so I I personally I think that we have the same journey. I started with salsa, got into bachata, then got introduced to kizamba and then Brazilian zouk, man. Um, I do not believe that kizamba is is a very good performative dance. But, you know, the one-on-one -on -one connection with your partner is unmatched in my opinion. I, I, I love Kizomba for the connection. So I definitely understand what you mean that when you say, you know, watching a Kizomba performance can be kind of boring. I definitely understand <laughs> yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I definitely understand that, man. But, you know, like I said, man, it's just that connection with your partner, man. It's, it's very nice. It's very cool. I love it. I love it. I, I agree. I agree. I agree. And it can be very captured. So I can tell you one of the videos, the videos that have more views in our Instagram, it's a video of Tarashinha with me and Susana that almost doesn't have any steps, but people get glued to the video. Yeah. I know it's not a show and a show it's different because you present it live and becomes different. But uh, so at the, what, that's why you're talking about the connection. When you have a connection, and the connection between you works and people around you feel the vibe of your connection, it's unmatchable. It's unmatchable. It's like, it's something from, it's even hard to, uh, to explain. It's even hard to explain. Because I look at the video and I think that, it, that it's nothing, but people love the video and it's crazy. Um, I, I, I want to try and put it into words and I, I want to see what you say about this, man. Uh, is it <laughs> like, 
Is it like, you know, you meeting, you know, maybe this random person and you both are able to speak the same language and you kind of just fit like puzzle pieces and you're able to just, you know, enjoy each other's company for that two or three minute song? Yeah, it, I, I, would, I, I agree. And I think it is. But I can tell you even more. There are some people that when you, you are in the, in the dancing kizoma, for example, and there are some people that you never saw in your whole life. And you go and you dance for that with that person the four or five minutes, and it looks like that person, the body and the connection of that person is made for you. It's incredible. The way you move, the way you feel, the way you breathe, everything is connected. And that happens to me sometimes, not a lot, but sometimes. And I feel like this is this is really weird. I believe uh, I'm not. I'm not. I believe in energy. I think that. Everything around us is energy. And when that person connects with you, I think what happens, I'm not an expert. I don't understand a lot of it. I think if that person has the same energy as you do, everything flows. It's, and it's incredible what happens. You, and some people don't even know how to dance very well. You know, It's not, the, not about the technique. It's the way they connect. It becomes, I know, I know it's a, lot, a lot of people say this, but sometimes it really becomes one. It's something really weird, really strange. Now, I definitely understand. I think, I think as social dancers, you know, we're always chasing that feeling. Like you said, it doesn't happen often when you find that perfect match. But when it does happen, you know, you really appreciate it. And you're always looking for, you know, that next experience. So I, I definitely, I 100% understand yeah. that. I definitely understand that. Um, since, we're, yeah. since we're speaking on connection, let me ask you this. Um, you know, for both leaders and followers, can you give me any tips, any words of wisdom, advice on how someone can improve their connection? Man, it's a, well, I can tell you two, two different things, okay? We talk, can talk about mind connection or body connection, okay? Mind connection is very simple, uh, is, is to trust the other person, okay? Understand that we have to work as a team, like I told you before, and if I don't work for the, our goal, and our goal is to achieve a connected dance, it doesn't work. And sometimes it's hard. Yeah, sometimes it's very hard for us because we have our own mind and we want to do our own thing. And when it is on, is over, there is nothing like that. We have to connect both to do our own thing together. You know, so I think that's that switch is the hardest thing uh, about the physical part. Um, there are several exercises that we do with our students to to help them understand connection. How how do you feel your partner? How how do you look for your partner? How do you, for example, when we don't use strong frames, okay? Because Kizomba doesn't have it, so we evolve if, uh, and then we try to teach the dance in a way that doesn't have any strength involved, and in a way that's be able to be danced with anyone. Doesn't matter the height, the size, doesn't matter. So connection is a very important part over there because if I'm not pulling my partner, my partner has to look for me. Yeah, if I'm not doing any strength with my partner, he has to have a very solid connection for us to understand. So we have some exercises that we do on our trainings, on our courses, and in our classes to help them to, to understand each other in terms of body connection. Hey, okay, I understand that, man. Let it's me, teachable, uh, it's teachable, okay? Oh. It's teachable. It's not perfect for everybody, yeah, because energy is different, but it's everybody can do it. It's Maybe it's not 100%, you know what I mean? But uh, everybody can do it. I, I believe it. I believe it. Let me ask you this. When I say the word musicality, what does that mean to you? For me, musicality, so uh, funny, your question is very funny because in, in my beginner class, I, I love beginner classes. Okay. If you ask me, Miguel, what classes you want to teach? I want to teach the beginner ones because I had a lot of fun. People have a lot of fun. And I think that's the most important one. So, because when you have a good beginner classes, then you can create on your own, yeah? If you have a strong basics, then you can create on your own. And one of the questions, one of the, the funny questions that I make in my classes is, who is the leader? Okay, the first thing that I say when people are starting, who is the leader? And everybody's, oh, it's the man, it's the gentleman. And I, I stop them and I say, no, the leader is the music, okay? When you listen to the music, the music will give the leader of the dance something to interpret. He will interpret and then the follower will follow and create all the beautiful movements and color of the dance. So that's how things work. So for me, musicality, it's everything on the dance. If you don't have the musicality, you're not dancing, you're doing steps. 
I turn off the music and it's going to be the same. So yeah, if you're not talking about technical stuff, for me, musicality is that, is the main purpose of what we do. Mm. Okay, um, let's get into the, maybe this is technical, maybe this is not, but you know, tell me, how does one improve their musicality? I think the obvious answer would be listen to music uh, because musicality is your interpretation of the music that is playing, right? If you listen to the music without going, trying to go to a, a lot of technical details, yeah, if you listen to the music, the music will get into you and you will start to listen to things, to hear things that you usually don't hear. So some instruments or the voice or the change of musicality or the, the change of the, um, of the melody uh, on the music on that part. And maybe that change of melody would be adaptable to a step that you already like. So maybe when the melody changes, you write adapt this and it makes sense. So for example, if there's a wave, uh, a waving part of the melody, maybe I can use a wave uh, movement on my dance and it becomes one with the music. So, like I, so for me, thinking about this, the most important thing about learning musicality is listen to the music. Listen to a lot of music. Uh, try to really listen. It's not just the music is playing and you're going with it. No. Listen. With which instruments are playing? What changes with the instruments? Um, I think that's the most important. But I don't want to go into a lot of technical stuff because that's boring. But for me, if I want to explain to someone that never danced or that are starting to dance, that would be what I would tell them. Okay, and let me, last question for you, sir. This is the last question I want to ask you. Um, can you give me one tip, one piece of advice that can make anyone a better dancer immediately? Man, I can give you that advice, but I already gave it to you. So it's not going to be a very interesting answer. Um, you're talking about kizomba, I think, right? So you're talking about kizomba because there is specifics, right? To be a good kizomba dancer is to understand that you and your partner are a team and you have to work together. If you do understand that, everything will work out much better and much faster. So I'm sorry, man. I didn't give you a very, you know, different, crazy stuff. But to be honest, I have to be honest. And I think this is the most important thing. Yeah, I, I like it, man. I definitely like it. Um, I definitely agree with it. And I definitely understand it. I, I, um, I want to thank you so much, Mr. Montero, for taking time with you to talk to me. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, no worries. And you don't have to call me Mr. Montero. You just call me Miguel because that's my... <laughs> My name, so don't okay. worry about it. I'm not that old. And well, my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. And whenever you need, I'm here. And yeah. Uh, real quick, well, I guess I got maybe a couple more questions for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you know, tell me. You know, do you have do you have any upcoming events? Anything you want to plug? Anything you want to share? Well, yeah, we have. Well, there are always upcoming events. Right now, I think things are getting better. Uh, Maybe a couple of months, we're not sure about what things were happening or not because of COVID. But right now, things are getting really easier, are getting better. So we're going to have, if you want to travel to Portugal, we're going to have a festival called Semba Nupe. Okay, it's the fifth edition of the festival. It's a Kizomba and Semba festival, but it's a more traditional festival. So um, you won't hear any urban kids or any fusion or anything like this. You will learn Kizomba, Semba and Tarashinha but uh, with no no fusions or so it's going to be more it's the it's the base core is the core of the, this festival if you want to do something even more extreme uh in march uh, me and susana we're going to do a, boot, a tarashinha boot camp so for people that like tarashinha and want to learn the movement the dance do understanding it yeah we're going to do a boot camp here in, in portugal it's going to be from it's going to be on the 5th of march and yeah, you guys can contact me. I'll let you know. That sounds perfect, man. That sounds amazing. Um, how can people get in contact with you? How can they reach out to you? Oh, very simple. You just go to YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, doesn't matter. And it is at Miguel e Susana. So Portuguese way, Miguel e Susana. Uh, I got it. I'm sorry. One more question, man. Um, I, I, see, <laughs> I see you speak English. 
Um, as yeah. a as a native English speaker, would I still be able to travel to, to Lisbon and you know take Kizoma classes, or would I have to learn Portuguese? No, 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 no. So, but the the main thing, like I told you, Lisbon is a different city. Yeah, it's multicultural. So, for example, if you go to, I teach in in three places. Okay, I teach in two schools. Is Jazzy. And in Jazzy, there is in Santos de Saldanha. And then I teach in Artidance, it's uh, Odi Velas. Uh, it's the northern part of Lisbon. If you go to Jazzy, that is like in the center of Lisbon, we always have a lot of foreign students. Uh, so people that are doing Erasmus or they are just traveling and want to try, because uh, as we are kind of known, you know, Miguel and Susana, we are kind of known around the world. When people come to Portugal, they come and do some of our classes. They go to our to our to the studio and do our classes. We don't do the class entirely in English. So uh, in the beginning of the classes, we always say, um, "Who understands Portuguese?" When they don't, okay. So the class is going to be in Portuguese. But if you have any questions, I'll be here to teach you in English. So it's adaptive. Uh, we do both. It's, uh, it's crazy. All right, that's awesome, man. Like I said, I would love to visit. I would love to visit one day. Um, man, you're welcome. Hey, 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 uh, Miguel, like I said, I won't hold you up any longer. I won't take any more of your time. Thank you so much, Miguel. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation with you, sir. My, my pleasure. I enjoyed the same. So thank you very much for the invitation and good luck for your podcast, brother. Hey, hey, thank you so much, Miguel. Good talking to you. <laughs> uh, take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>